So I'm curious, when you went outside today, did you enjoy the cool air? It's hard to believe that two weeks ago today, it was triple digits. It was like 112 out. And when you came at the 930 service, it was already 100. And most of you had taken your bulletin, your sermon notes, anything you could get to, and you're fanning yourselves, just trying to cool off. And, and it's, when you have that kind of temperature, that kind of weather, you're outside, it's oppressive, isn't it? It just feels so present, so overwhelming. And it's hard to find relief. It's hard to find an escape. I would say when it comes to legalism, it's the same way. Legalism, individuals that create rules that define who's godly, who's close to God, who's spiritual. And it's like being in a 112 weather where it just feels so oppressive and there's no relief. How, how do you ultimately experience relief when you're under that kind of oppression? That's exactly what Paul is telling Timothy in this passage. As you know, the first three chapters was Paul explaining, this is how we're to conduct ourselves in the church. This is the way that we understand and see things and what God is doing. And then I explained that chapters four, five, and six, that Paul was in and go on to talk about how do we practice this? How do we actually live it out? And so when he begins chapter four, he's alerting Timothy that one of the things that will sabotage a great community of God is the absence of grace and the presence of legalism. And he's charging him, first and foremost, guard your own heart, Timothy. Help, help the spirit to work in your life so that you're receptive. But teach your congregation, especially those, especially the hypocrites that are preaching this false gospel. And he's so strong in his words, he literally says that people who teach and practice this literally are demonic. It's coming from the pit of hell. So you realize when he's using that kind of language, this is really serious, but I want to alert us to the fact that we can look at this passage and disregard its application to our life. We can think about it being another church or someone else and fail to see that all of us have the propensity to be hypocrites, to be legalists. And so that's part of my prayer is that we would be sensitive to what God is saying and that we would hear the Lord and have a level of conviction. The assertion that I would make is that if it must be gained, it's not grace. Can I repeat that? If it must be gained, it's not grace. And so what Paul is going to emphasize to us is that this whole idea of being receptive to the Spirit and his conviction is about living in a space of grace. And I want, to, I want to emphasize this for just a moment. As we build through on this, through this passage, it is my burden, my concern that many Christians, including at Cornerstone, don't live in a space of grace. Some of you live with this sense of condemnation. You don't feel worthy to come to God. You look at your life and your failures and you don't feel like God really cares that he's, he's looking at you with judgment. Some of you feel that way in your family. You feel that someone's always criticizing you, judging you, condemning you. And it might be in your workplace, your school. And the reality is that probably more often than not, you're condemning yourself. And I want to alert you to the fact there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. The gospel of Christ is a gospel of grace. It's not just we can't save ourselves and we need the spirit to save us. That's absolutely true. But we need God's grace and his spirit all the way to the end. And so if we're not receiving grace, here's one of the great tragedies. If we're not receiving and living in the space of grace, we don't offer grace. If we don't know how to receive grace, we don't know how to offer grace so some of the tension in your relationships, the woundedness is because you're not providing that grace. Many times unwittingly, it comes with an ulterior motive. And that's one of the things that's going to surface in this text today. I want to show you three qualities or characteristics of legalism. And then what's going to happen is, is that as we march through this text, I want to make a comparison and contrast between legalism and grace. So as it comes on the screen, here are the three things that we're going to explore. Legalism assumes authority, it assumes control, and it assumes independence. And in each of these categories, there is a potential for us to get off track and depart from grace. I want to read verses 1 through 5. If you found 1 Timothy 
chapter 4, and you're able to stand, would you please stand with me to help me honor the Lord and the reading of his word? And as I read, I want you to notice Paul's accusation and then ultimately his commentary on those who live as legalists. Verse 1, chapter 4, the Spirit clearly says, says, in the latter times, some will abandon the faith and follow deceiving spirits and things taught by demons. Such teachings come through hypocritical liars whose consciences have been seared as with a hot iron. They forbid people to marry and order them to abstain from certain foods, which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and who know the truth. For everything God created is good and nothing is to be rejected if it's received with thanksgiving because it is consecrated by the word of God and prayer. Thank you. May be seated. So let's immediately start with that first characteristic of legalism, that legalism assumes authority. The context of that is that individuals that live in this manner and way they decide for themselves that they are the authorities of who's spiritual, who's righteous, who's close to God. And in that place, they ultimately are judging others and they're defining what they have to do to ultimately be spiritual or to have a proximity. But here's one of the great sorrows of that is that what they promise is never experienced. When they say, do this, do that, live this way, and you'll be a spiritual person, you'll be close to God, the reality is, is as I've already argued, what they're inviting is greater condemnation, and you feel farther from God, you're farther away from him. And one of the things that we fail to see when we fall into the trap of legalism is that what we're actually saying is that grace is not necessary, that we can write our own rules, we can behave in a certain manner. And ultimately, what it's declaring, and why Paul says it's demonic, is because it's basically declaring that Jesus didn't have to die. That if, if we can craft our own way to be spiritual and position ourselves close to God, then Jesus didn't have to die. And when we're in that place, we struggle then to come to God because we don't feel spiritual. We're, we're, if we're honest with ourselves, we feel like sinners. Go back to the promise that Jesus Christ died for our sins. That's what we were singing about this morning. He died for our sins. And the result, he made a pathway for us to draw close to God. The writer of Hebrews has declared that no matter how you feel today, what you think of yourself, God looks at you through the robes of Christ's righteousness. I, I'm confident that as I say this, that there are many days where you feel very ungodly. And the reality is, is that God isn't looking at you going, you're a wretch, you're a mess. He's looking at you through the lens of Christ's righteousness who died on the cross to pay for every one of your sins, past, present, and future. And so when he makes that declaration, he says, come with confidence in the throne room of grace. Come with an assurance that Jesus has paved the way. That's the essence of grace. And when legalism is present, it denies those profound truths of our experience and opportunity as followers of Christ Jesus. Look at verse 1. The Spirit clearly says that in latter times, some will abandon the faith and follow deceiving spirits and things taught by demons. Let me give you a context of what's being said. In latter days, in the 21st century, we tend to read that and we're thinking, oh, this is what's going to happen right before Jesus comes back. And we start sizing up and estimating, oh, I see these kinds of hypocrites everywhere. The fact of the matter is, in the context when Paul writes that, the Old Testament prophets would often speak about what would take place as time progressed. And every one of the believers, including Paul, believed that Jesus would come back that day. When Jesus ascended into heaven, the disciples were assuming that within days, if not weeks, Jesus would come back. So when he uses that term latter times, it's a present tense term. He's saying, I'm looking and I'm witnessing and I'm seeing that these very things are happening and will happen. And that then speaks to the fact that that's true for every single generation. It isn't just our generation. It was previous generations that because of pride, the fact that pride is in every one of our hearts, we are all susceptible to be judgmental and to be hypocritical liars. So as Paul sets that up, he frames that, he's bringing it back to this idea, as I've already stated, that this idea, this false doctrine comes from the pit of hell. 
It's, it's Satan himself that wants you to believe that as a Christian, you're condemned and there is no grace. And so Paul is addressing with Timothy, there are people in your church that's teaching this. And it's wounding their faith. It's discouraging them. You've got to bring back the truth of grace and how it's applied to us. Look at the next verse, verse 2. As he stated the issue, now he's going to state the agents that are bringing that about. Such teachings come through hypocritical liars whose consciences have been seared as with a hot iron. What is he talking about? These individuals have failed to listen to the Spirit of God bring conviction in their own lives. They refuse to let the Spirit address the issues in their heart. They're so focused on the externals that they're not mindful of God's work in their own lives. And when they hear a sermon or they read a text from scripture or they're looking at truth, they disregard it. They immediately begin to think of others that need to hear that. They're already anticipating who they're going to send the link of the sermon to because that person really needs to respond to that. And the problem, and here's the real danger of how each of us are susceptible to that. The problem is that when we do that, we don't realize that over the course of time, our conscience becomes hardened. It becomes callous. If you've been traveling with us through 1 Timothy, this is the third time he's mentioned conscience. He says, you, have to, you're, you need a good conscience. And we've understood that a good conscience means that we're people of integrity, that we're doing what's right, even when no one's look, looking, that we're actually doing what the psalmist says in 139, that we're sitting before the Lord and we're asking God, search our hearts, see if there's any anxious way in me, if there's anything that's offensive to you, Lord. And that's something that I'm asking for us as a church to do every single day. When I tell you to read the Bible each day, it's not so you can check it off the list and say, I got my chapter done. I read a few verses. It's so that you're literally listening to the spirit of God that's in you. We saw that last week. We are the church. It's not this building. It's each of us as we've understood that the Holy Spirit, if you put your faith in Christ Jesus, you are the temple of God. And that means that there's a necessity for us to stop and listen to the Spirit to say, this area in your life needs to be cleaned up. We need to, we need to address this. And one thing that I want to emphasize to you is that God's longing to work in our lives to sanctify us, first and foremost, so that we're not hardened and bitter, our conscience is seared, but it's not because he's disappointed, it's because he loves us. He wants us to be whole and complete in him so that we experience the goodness and the fullness of God and we're living in the space of grace that he's describing. Jesus addressed this issue over and over. When you read the Gospels, he's confronting the Pharisees and the teachers of the law and all the legalists, and he's saying that you only think of the outside and you're trying to gain control and authority of who's in and who's out. Think about the Sermon on the Mount. As he begins his public ministry, you get to chapter 7, and he makes a declaration that we're all familiar with. Let me show it to you as it comes on the screen. Read this out loud with me. Are you ready? Let's say it together. Do not judge, or you too will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you'll be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Consistently, he would say to the Pharisees, is that you lack mercy. You will not show mercy to anybody. And as a result, you will not receive mercy. If you're going to judge people that way, that's the way it's going to come down for you. If you're going to create all of these criteria of who is spiritual, who's godly, then you're going to be measured in the same way. So in this particular place, he's saying, the way that you judge, so you'll be judged. And ultimately, Jesus isn't just speaking to the Pharisees. He's speaking to everybody that's choosing to follow him. It's saying, you need to stop and listen. Do you remember how the rest of the passage goes? If you get down to verse 3, down through 7, he says, first get the log out of your own eye. Does that sound familiar? Get the log out of your own eye. It's implying the very things that we're talking about, that we've actually sit with the Lord long enough to hear his voice and help us to see that there are places of anger, resentment, bitterness, disdain. And when we begin to do that, now all of a sudden we begin to realize that we can then help our brother and sister get the speck out of their own eye. Spouses that are here, this is so important. 
this, this is so applicable because we can be so judgmental towards our spouses. My college friends that are here, we can do the same thing when it comes to our roommates and the people that we're hanging out with. We have this, this understood criteria in our head of what they're supposed to do and how they're supposed to live. And then we want to correct them and fix them and we start speaking in their lives when we haven't taken the time to listen to the Holy Spirit and let the Holy Spirit convict us about our own pride and about our own sin. He says, when we actually get to that place, we begin to have a clear understanding of what the real issue is in our friends, our spouses, and others' lives. Then when the Spirit compels us, we actually have a platform to do so because they're seeing that we have put the same standard to ourselves, that we're actually listening to the word of God, not just pointing the finger. And when we begin to do that, we can actually help our brothers and sisters in that situation. So when I was a boy, our family on a number of summers would travel to Indiana. So I was originally from Indiana and I had relatives that lived back in Indiana. My grandmother lived in the north called Hammond, Indiana. And when we would travel out there, my aunt Vicky would take me down to Southern Indiana because my uncle Frank owned a melon farm. So seriously, Kamani. So 10 years old, I'm driving the tractor around the farm. It's like the traditional farm, uh, the, the barn, you know, that's got the loft and you can jump out of it. And it's got all the hay. It was like, this is amazing. I loved it. And one of the things that I especially enjoyed is that on every meal, we had fresh melon. And so I remember Uncle Frank taking me out into the field and showing, how do you pick a ripe melon? So this being a honeydew melon. And, and he would say, part of it, you start looking at the color. The color begins to change. It becomes a little bit more yellow. In this case, a little have a little lighter green. And then the weight of it, when it starts feeling heavy, you know it's starting to become riper because it's beginning to have juice. The water is now beginning to settle and it's going to make it sweet. He said then where the stem is, if you push on the stem, it's going to be softer. This melon is not ripe. The color is still too light. The stem is not soft. And then ultimately after you've done that, he says, then you smell it. Because at a certain point, there's a, a wonderful aroma but then he pointed to this other melon. He says, but then there are melons that are overly ripe. And he says, the way that you know that is that when you pick it up, they're really soft. The rind is soft. And when you smell it, they smell fermented. He says, the only thing you can do with those kinds of melons is throw them away. What Jesus is declaring is that he's saying that we have this tendency to look on the outside we come to church, we size people up, we look on the outside and we're like, oh yeah, they're really spiritual. They're really godly. And that was the case when Jesus is talking to the Pharisees. But as he declared to the Pharisees, he says, you are like whitewashed tombs full of dead man's bones. He's saying, you're like a rotten melon on the outside. You look perfectly fine, but on the inside, you're rancid. You're full of bitterness. And so the caution for us that Paul is giving first to Timothy and then indirectly to us is that this is the reason why we sit before the Lord. Because when we do, then it brings this next thing of grace, that grace fosters conviction. I want to return to an earlier comment and give us a little bit more insight. When we look at verse 2, as he's talking about these hypocritical liars and their conscience have been seared, I don't know all of you, and I certainly don't know everybody online, but I know many of you. And my knowledge of you is that you want to be right before the Lord. And so when the, when the Lord is working, he's helping us to see what he longs to correct. For those that were here last week, you remember that I shared on my way to church how somebody cut me off, got stuck at the red light, and my irritation, my frustration, even anger. And I confess that before you. As the day progressed, I began to pray and talk to the Lord and then picked back up on that conversation the next morning. And what God began to show me is, is that, that when we're angry, the majority of times that, that that circumstance, that person cutting me off is not what created anger. Anger was in my heart. That was just the agency that God revealed that. So with further prayer and consideration, God began to reveal that I was holding some resentment towards an individual. And the way it was displayed, and we're going to talk about this more in the next section, is that, is that when we're in that place, we're not actually letting the Lord work in our heart. We withhold grace. Mm -hmm. 
one of the ways that God showed me is that I'd received a text and I did not respond to that text. And he showed me that the reason for me doing that was, is that there was a part in my, in my subconscious where this was going to be my punishment. If this is a way that you respond, this way you react, then I'm not going to respond back to you willingly. Now, all of a sudden, the Lord has brought me to what the real issue is. And I go back to my knowledge of most of you, is that when the Lord reveals that to you, I'm just going to alert you to, it's hard. The Lord really started emphasizing this to me about five or six years ago. And I'm like, yeah, that's great. I want to be sanctified. I want to be more like Jesus. Isn't that appropriate? And then as it began to happen, I began to realize there were some things down inside that I didn't want to know. It was easier to perceive or pretend that everything was great, isn't it? To tell yourself, I'm fine, no problems, no crazy sins. I'm just right where God wants me to be. And God's like, I love you too much to leave that in your heart. And my sanctification is a commitment to bring that out. So when you have that fit of anger or rage or resentment or whatever it might be, it's pointing back to your heart. And he's saying, let me show you to refine you. And I restate my earlier assertion. It isn't because he's disappointed. It's because he loves you and he wants what's whole and complete in your life. He wants your relationship to be restored, to be vibrant, and especially with him. So aren't you willing? Isn't that a longing as hard as it might be? Don't you want the spirit to work in your life and bring refinement? Because that is the picture of grace. Here's the second thing that legalism does as it tries to control, not just to have authority of defining who's spiritual, who gets in, but they define the rules of how that happens, what must take place. Watch how this played out in, the, in verse 3 in that particular scenario. They forbid people to marry in order them to abstain from certain foods, which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. So if you go back in this particular case, there were two specific things that Paul was noticing and probably not just in Ephesus, but as he traveled around is that there was this asceticism that said, if you really want to be spiritual, be single, don't marry. So think about all my single friends. You are the most spiritual people in the room. Wow. For all my married friends, too bad for you. You miss the, you miss the opportunity to be close to God. And then he goes on and he, and he talks about certain foods, that you avoid these certain foods. And, and I have a feeling that if hot fudge Sundays existed at that time, that would have been one of the things on the list. And I would be out, right? Completely ungodly. Okay, what's the context of this? Paul's noticing this. And you might be sitting here thinking, this is completely irrelevant to me. It has nothing to do with me. But the fact of the matter is, this is just an example of rules that are made. A little bit more context. At that time, when Paul writes Timothy, there is a sect that's growing called Gnosticism. For all intents and purposes, a heresy. Some of you have heard that term before. Gnosko is a Greek word for knowledge. So Gnosticism was a basis that the more knowledge that you had, the more spiritual and closer you are to God. I would say there are still forms of Gnosticism today. I think that historically, going back many years ago, Cornerstone Bible church elevated knowledge above everything else. The more Bible knowledge you have, the more spiritual you are. And yet we know from Pharisees in history that people that have a lot of biblical knowledge and don't let the spirit work in their lives are hypocrites. They're the ones creating all the rules. And so that's exactly what was going on. Now, here's two things for you to know within Gnosticism. One of the tenets of that false doctrine was, is that, yes, we live in a body of flesh that's prone to sin and the flesh is going to die and it's evil. And so one sex said, so then live whatever way you want. Crazy party, sin, it doesn't matter because this is going to die. Your spirit's what's going to go to heaven. The reaction of the other sect is that's completely wrong that you should have a serious and a soberness about falling God. Doesn't that sound appropriate? Doesn't that sound biblical? And they said, therefore, deny yourself of pleasure because denying yourself pleasure actually makes you more spiritual. So, so don't get married and have sex because if you do that, you're not spiritual. Don't have delicious food because you're not spiritual. Deny all these pleasures. Go back to the verse. Don't get stuck there. Look at Paul's commentary, what he says about this. 
They forbid people to marry and order them to abstain from certain foods, which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those, by who? Cornerstone family? Who's to receive it? Those who know the truth. Those that have the spirit of God know what's really true. You know what he's alluding to? It's what James said in chapter one. All good things come down from the father of heavenly lights. All good things come down from the father of heavenly lights. Do you love your spouse? God's blessed you with that. Do you love delicious food? God has blessed you with that. You can go on and drink or cute kids, cute grandkids for goodness sakes. Come on, grandparents, let's (laughs) brag a little because good grandkids, comfortable home, amazing memories, Scenery. I, I see some of your posts on, on Instagram and you're walking these beautiful places, Yosemite and all these different locations. God created those things. And the expectation that in that space, you're looking at your spouse, your children, your friends, your memories, and you're like, God, you are so good. You're not diminishing that disregarding that, thinking that somehow that makes you more spiritual. When you do that, you're robbing God of his glory. God deserves the glory for his goodness. That's what Paul is asserting. That's what he's telling them and how that fails. I know of a denomination. This plays out in churches. I know of a denomination that require all their members to read only the King James Version. No other versions. In their worship, you can only listen to hymns. All the praise music that we sing, it's not spiritual. It's all about us. So they completely disregard. Say, you can only sing and listen to hymns. They have a dress code. There's a dress code you have to have when you go to their church. All of you fail that dress code except for Kamani. <laughs> Kamani, dude, you look so sharp. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, in all seriousness, right? And so in their case, it's not just a matter of choice and a willingness. It's a matter of mandate that says, all of you must do that. It goes down the list. There's all kinds of things that they add to these particular things. And here's the trouble with that. It's based upon guilt, manipulation, and condemnation. That's how it's structured. But we can easily point the finger, as I've already said, and completely ignore ourselves. Think about how you make determinations of who you're going to love. I'm going to get personal to the spouses that are here. There are times where you have your expectations of your spouse, and when they don't meet your expectation, you are deciding whether you're going to love them back. You're like, well, that's pretty bold, Bruce. I'm going to get real personal, husbands. When you don't feel like you're having as much sex as you think you deserve, do you continue to love your wife unconditionally or do you withdraw? Will you, do you pull back? Do you punish them? Ladies, are there times where your husband is busy, he's working, he's not giving you attention, and in that place, you begin to become bitter, you're critical, you nag, or you withdraw? Every time you do those kinds of things, you are actually in judgment of them. You've created your own criteria of who you're going to love. And it's not just with spouses, it's with all of us. Think about who you choose to be nice to, kind. When we have the greeting time, isn't it true there are times you've already sized up who you're going to talk to and who you're not? (laughs) Yeah, I don't know that person. I, yeah, they don't look very nice. I don't know. I don't don't want to talk to them. (laughs) We're all guilty of that, Cornerstone family. We're all guilty of that. We look at what they're wearing, we're estimating what they look like, where they come from, what their education is, and we have all this criteria of whether we're actually going to love them as Christ loved the church. And we can all fall into that trap. How about this one, forgiveness? Some of you right now are struggling to forgive. Some of you have refused to forgive. Hear this. Jesus himself said, In Matthew chapter 18, unless you forgive one another, your heavenly father will not forgive you. You're like, well, they're not sincere. I hear that all the time. I can't forgive that person. They're not sincere. That is not, if you read scripture, that is not a criteria whether you should forgive. In fact, it's not even a criteria that they ask for forgiveness. Jesus on the cross prayed to the very people that were spitting in his face, forgive them for they don't know what they do. So we have forgiveness. 
judgment criteria standards of who we're going to forgive in spite of the fact that Christ makes a mandate that we're all to forgive, which is a whole nother sermon of why that's necessary. But, but they're just examples that I'm giving. And oftentimes it plays out in our subconscious of who deserves blessing. That we're looking around and I'm like, man, and I raised my kids to love Jesus and now they're not walking with the Lord. And that person, they never paid any attention, just dropped their kids off and look at their kids love Jesus. And we're deciding they don't deserve a blessing or their spouse or their home or whatever it might be. And we're looking at them and we're saying, what about us? Why don't we, why don't I have these things? All of those are aspects of what Paul is addressing. And when we fall into that, we become the hypocritical liars that he's describing. And it goes back to the whole idea of having that conviction, but especially realizing that God gives good gifts. God gives good gifts. Not not comparing to what someone else's gifts are. What God's given you is his chosen blessing for you. And it's his desire and his will. And so it's important for us to realize that grace then recognizes blessing. That that's exactly what is being said, that grace recognizes blessing. Now, as I make that statement, there, I think there's something that we need to be mindful of. Is it going back to like the judgment part? Some of you are thinking, well, isn't there supposed to be discernment? Absolutely. When you read that passage in Matthew chapter 7, there is a difference between discernment and judgment. And I'll give you one example. Paul writes to the Corinthians and he says, bad, uh, bad company corrupts good morals. Bad company corrupts good morals. You know what he's saying? Is that you need discernment of the Holy Spirit to discern a person who's in rebellion and denying truth. Because if you align yourself with that person, more than likely you are going to shift in your own convictions and truth. So when we talk about not being judgmental, it's not discarding discernment. It expects that when you've sought the Lord and the Lord's convicted you, that now you have that clarity to have that discernment and to really understand. But the other thing too that I want you to know is that grace does not lower the standard. Some of you have confused tolerance with grace. Some of you have thought, and that's where in this certain part of the passage, you're having angst because you're thinking, Pastor Bruce is basically, we, we lowered the standard for grace. Not at all. I'll give you one example. Please write down John chapter 8, verses 1 through 11. Familiar passage. Here's the context. It's early in the morning. Jesus is already in the temple. He's teaching there in the temple courts. And the Pharisees and the teacher law bring a woman that they caught in adultery. They drop her to the ground and they say to Jesus, this woman was caught in adultery and the law of Moses says that she must be stoned. What do you say? Now, John gives us the background that they were trying to trap Jesus, one, because they don't have authority to commit murder, to execute somebody, but two, whether he was going to support the law of Moses and ultimately show a flaw in his convictions. These individuals who have established themselves as the spiritual authority have crafted all of the rules, and when they do that, they actually change the rules. If you go back to Leviticus chapter 20, verse 10, that's not what the passage says. It brings both the man and the woman, and there's no man present in this judgment. And Jesus knows exactly what the word is. So think about the irony in this. It's Jesus who's God. Jesus is God, and he's the one that wrote the law, and no one knows it better than he does. So he knows exactly when they're changing and distorting and coming up with all their rules. And so one of the things that I want you to notice then is that legalism assumes then independence, not just having the authority or writing the rules, but it assumes an independence that they can do whatever they want and not be held accountable, not to God and not to others. But Jesus being God holds them accountable. Do you remember how the narrative goes? If you're not familiar with it, let, let, me, let me finish it. So at that point, Jesus doesn't respond to their accusations and their inquiry. He just gets down and he begins to write something in the dirt. And as he continues to write, he then gets up as he finishes. And I think he looked around the group, maybe 10, 11, 12 men. And he says, the one who is without sin may cast the first stone. And then he got back down and he wrote something else. And as he's writing, they left one at a time, starting with the oldest. We could speculate all day long about what was he writing. 
the reality is that Jesus Christ being God knew exactly what was in their hearts. And something happened when they began to realize they were caught. They are now accountable. So the rest of the narrative is that Jesus then looks at the woman and he says, where are your accusers? She says, they've all left, sir. And his response was, neither do I accuse you. Go and leave your sin no more. You see, grace and tolerance are different. Jesus didn't say to her, keep sinning, do whatever you want, have a blast. <laughs> He's saying, mercy has saved your life. They, they are going to be judged because they refuse to give mercy. I am showing you mercy. And mercy then invites you to do what's right. Peter put it this way. The kindness of the Lord leads to repentance. The kindness of the Lord leads to repentance. Just because you haven't experienced consequences and you've been in sin doesn't mean that there won't be consequences and you won't be disciplined. Don't make that mistake. Realize that where you're at today is out of the mercy of God. Mercy withholds punishment. Grace then gives us something that we didn't deserve. Did you get that? Mercy withholds what we do deserve, and grace gives us something that we don't deserve. And that's exactly what Jesus showed to that woman, and he's showing to us. So then ultimately, the take-home truth is that grace inspires praise. Don't you think that that woman in that moment praised Jesus, praised God? When she realized that her sin actually did deserve death, and yet he intervened? And the same thing is true for us. Watch how Paul then frames it. I want to read verse four and five together. For everything God created is good. Nothing is to be rejected if it's received with thanksgiving. I'll go back to your cute kids and your friends and all those things that are so endearing to you. God created them and they should be received with thanksgiving because verse five, it is consecrated by the word of God in prayer. That when you have the spirit of God in your life, and you're receiving it from the Lord, you're giving him the praise and honor. As I stated earlier, he gets the glory for that. I want to show you two pictures. So I want to first show you this picture of this mansion. So I've shared at different times that Monica, I love to go down to the beach. So last Sunday after church, after finished the disciples group meeting, we, we drove down to Corona Del Mar. You ever been there? And so there is a bluff called Inspiration Point. So don't get the wrong ideas. Just there were like a lot of people out there overlooking Corona Del Mar to the west and, or excuse me, to the north and just ready to watch the sunset. But if you've ever been to that location, the homes are like off the hook. So behind me, this would have been like a picture of one of the mansions behind me. And there was this like $180,000 Mercedes that was parked by it. Imagine if you're there at Inspiration Point and you're turning around and you have this sense of entitlement. Because that's another thing that this text implies but doesn't actually state is that the hypocritical liars are filled with entitlement. They think they deserve. And that's why they're trying to exercise authority and control. And that's why Paul emphasized the importance of thanksgiving. Because when you're humble and you're thankful, you don't have a sense of entitlement. Some people in that setting would look at this and go, this really stinks. Those people don't deserve that kind of home, that kind of car. I've worked hard my whole life. Why do they have that kind of stuff? Are they any better than I am? It sounds ridiculous, but at different times, we've all been guilty of that, going back to sizing up and who deserves and who doesn't. But think about what was in front of us, and this is the picture I took that day. Have you ever just sat and watched a sunset? Have you ever been in that place not thinking about what's behind you and what you don't have, but what you do have? Have you ever just looked and watched the create creativity of God? Think about it. For those who know what I'm talking about, when a sunset happens, God's creativity takes place. These brilliant, vibrant colors, especially when you're down by the coast and there's clouds and the light's filtering through those clouds. And there's God working. It, it, it isn't... It doesn't just stay there. It's progressive. The colors begin to change, the, the movement. And when you're 
understanding that all good things come down from the Father of heavenly lights, all of a sudden you are reckoning with the fact that you are in the presence of God. God painted this landscape and says, praise me because I deserve it. Praise me because of my creativity and my love and I prepared and made this special. And then have that memory with somebody else. You don't have to be married to experience God's faithfulness and have memories that say God is good all the time. God is good all the time. Now, some of you that come every Sunday are looking at your outlines and you're saying, wow, Pastor Bruce didn't give us any action points today. No homework. No, 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 no. (laughs) If that's what you think, you got one major homework today. Don't wait off tomorrow. Don't wait till Tuesday. Today, when you leave, I want you to write down your praises. Write down God's goodness. Give that space to give him glory because he deserves it. Even even in your difficult predicament, God is worthy of praise. Please bow your heads with me. Father, I don't know all of the predicaments of my brothers and sisters here. I don't know the conditions of their hearts. I know know how you've convicted me. So my first prayer is that in these closing moments, that your spirit would speak and alert them to a conviction and that they would find that refreshing and embrace it and choose to seek your forgiveness and cleansing and to take action where needed. And if need be, that they would come forward and be prayed for so they would have the ability and the courage to do so. If there's anyone here today that has yet to receive you, the faith, the gift of faith, talking about goodness, you've given us the gift of faith so that we'd be saved, that they would seize that opportunity today. And then I pray that we would all be quick to let praises come from our mouths. And I pray that in this closing song, that that would just give a platform for that to take place. It's in your name, Jesus, I pray, amen.